We gathered in the presence of God, our Creator, who offers us unconditional love and grace. We have gathered in the presence of Christ, who calls us to live with integrity and compassion. We have gathered in the presence of the Holy Spirit, who sustains us in trial and rejoicing. In our living and our dying, we belong to God. In the shadow of the cross, we sing for joy. Let us open our hearts and minds and join together in worship. And in the unison prayer, our God of hope, we thank you for the gift of our Savior Jesus, who is willing to be betrayed and suffer death on the cross. Enable us to live in the shadow of the cross and with the hope of resurrection. Hear us as we continue praying the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And continuing with unison confession. Our God, who gives us birth, we are faithful people who do not always live intentionally or gracefully. We are faithful people who are not always aware or thoughtful. We are faithful people who usually choose busyness over reflection. We are a faithful people who fall prey to anxiety, which stems from the world in chaos. We are a faithful people who fall into insecure patterns of making assumptions. We are faithful people who generally live excessively. We are a faithful people who confess our sins, the things which we have done and left undone. We are a faithful people who stand in need of unconditional love, authenticity of personhood, and courage to live loving, simple, and genuine lives. We ask for forgiveness and guidance as we continue growing as faithful people. God hears the confession of our hearts, lips, and lives. God loves us because of us in spite of ourselves. God forgives us. We are able to start each day fresh and new. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit of God, speak your peace. Speak your peace. Holy Spirit of God, speak your peace, speak your peace. Now and at the hour of our death, amen, amen. Yeah. 
A reading from the Gospel of John. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for the charge against him. And when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they began to shout, Crucify! Crucify! And Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are a friend of Caesar you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at the place known as a stone pavement. It was the day of preparation of the Passover and it was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, and they shouted, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My dear friends, I heard a true story about a convict in a Kentucky prison. His name was Jack Joe Holland. He wrote a very touching prayer and he sent it to a Jesuit newsletter. A part of it reads, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you a bent and broken man. I come from a place they call Death Row and ask that you take pity, Lord, on a convict's wretched soul. Dry these tear-stained eyes. Have mercy on this awful man. Please hear his mournful cries. That man certainly trusted in the words of Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My dear friends, it was for sincere, repentant people like Jack Joe that Jesus came. It is for you and me that he came. His words on the cross were spoken not only for those who had rejected him, but also for you and me. We are all broken, all wounded, all in need of healing. Good Friday brings us to our senses. 
We come to the cross carrying our own baggage, our sins, our failures, the word of encouragement not spoken, the visit not made, the trust betrayed, the angry word, the list of times you and I have broken the commandments. We come to the cross and Jesus takes that baggage and hoists it on his own shoulders. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus died for all of us. God's mercy is eternal. God's love unconditional. As someone once wrote, there is no saint without a past and no sinner without a future. Our future lies in the hands of a compassionate, just God. That's why we call this Friday good. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Here we have Jesus hanging on the cross, suffering, persecuted, being scourged, going through an immense amount of pain. And he says to the, to the criminal on the cross next to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise, the word Jesus used on the cross to describe heaven, is actually very rare in the Bible. It is actually a Persian word meaning enclosure or park or garden. And our text offers the first time that this word appears in Scripture. I want to pose the question to you this, today because it might even seem inappropriate, but still, have you wondered what heaven is like? Wonder where it is, wonder what we will do there, wonder whether it will be fun and worry that it might be boring. What will we wear? What will we eat? Where will we live? Would you recognize people in their new bodies and wonder what those bodies will actually look like? What will the climate be like? How will we get around? How high will we be able to jump? And how fast will we be able to run? Those of us who can still do that. Will those of us who are married still be partners in some celestial ways that surpasses marriage as we know it? Will there be animals? And will our beloved pets who have died put their wet noses in the palms of our hands and beg us to take them for daily walks? What will our seniors be like? What will our babies, our middle-aged people, will they all be the same age? Will we see God face to face and what will he look like or she look like? To put this as simple as I can, Jesus loved the criminal on the cross and wanted to be with him. So what does that say to you and I? Jesus loves you and wants to be with you. Thankfully, the criminal experienced this love just before he died. Regrettably, he did not experience this love until then. How different that criminal's life would have been had he only lived it with Jesus walking by his side. It doesn't have to be that way for you. You don't have to wait until the last minute of your life. I'm probably preaching to the choir, isn't it so? But we have turned to Jesus, I believe, and... We need to even acknowledge the fact that we want him to walk or walk with him or him walk with us. 
You know, I just returned from a mission trip to Cuba a few days ago. And I'm not getting into the history of that country that has been facing strife and hardships for so many years. But the churches that I visited, in fact, the one church we fitted a um, water filtration system because water was only accessible by the wells under the ground. You imagine them having to lower a bucket into that well. Unfit for human consumption. Every drop of water you had to drink had to be boiled. And here we fitted a water filtration system. The village came to the church once it was completed and surrounded us. You know what? One of the persons that came shouted at the top of his voice, in Spanish of course, Today we have found paradise. Wow. I couldn't hold back my tears, nor could many others. Today we have found paradise. This poor thief on the cross, or criminal, had found paradise. He was converted at that point. He was baptized at that point. Because Jesus made that possible. And Jesus will make that possible for each of us. All we ask is for him to be with us. Amen. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. John is such a loving disciple. He was the one who laid his breast, uh, laid on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. He is the one who proclaimed love. His fourth gospel is different from the synoptics because he's sharing that love. Jesus wore the robe of purple as we wear a purple robe today because he was king of kings and lord of lords. Not the kings of this world, but the king of love. The king of love our shepherd is. He being the king was a one who loved and not desired to rule over people, but desired that his love would be the ruling force in all of life. There's great mystery. I think that's a good way to put some of all that we cannot understand about the scriptures. And as our colleague was saying, <laughs> what it's going to be like in paradise, whether we're going to be happy or bored, I think it's going to be a wonderful place. I think it's going to be where God's love is. From John chapter 19 and chapter and verse 25, Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Several things we can remember about Jesus. He never stopped being the king of king, kings and the one who loved all his disciples, all those who would turn to him. He never excluded anyone, and he always was caring. Before he went to the cross, he gave us the beautiful words in John where he said, I go and prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. Here he's getting ready to be killed, tortured, and in every way put to humility. His care was for someone else. Here, his care is especially shown for his mother. That's, that's perhaps the obvious part of this scripture because Jesus' mother was there at the foot of the cross where there were many that would want to kill the mother of Jesus because maybe she would have some more children that would think they were the son of God. And so maybe that's the reason Jesus said to her, said to John, woman. He did not say mother. He said woman for the purpose of of making her distinct as one who is not with him in the terms of one who would be able to be destroyed, but one who would be able to be shown to be the son of the mother of the son who was the lover of God, John. And so to put that together into a position of love is such an amazing thing. I cannot think that Jesus would ever put down any woman by calling her a woman 
but rather he raised Mary in that sense to one where love would be expressed in a family. He provided her social security, which they didn't have in those days, but John would take her into his family and, and she probably having no means of support would be there and her love would be shown in that home and that love would prevail. Jesus is one who always, no matter where he is, no matter what he is suffering, and if he's very much tired and exhausted, and here he is on the cross, he, only, he did, used a few words, just a few words, and those words I could talk about and anyone could talk about for months and years because he conveyed that love. So what I get out of these three words is that Jesus loves us with an everlasting love, and he desires that no matter where we are and who we are, that we should follow him in loving those around us, putting ourselves away from the fame and the shame that Jesus would not want us to endure. Amen. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I've been avoiding this one. I've tried to get other ones every year. This one makes me uneasy. It does not fit into my compartment of Jesus. But as I reflected on it, Jesus, we believe, is fully God and fully human. And in his humanity, Jesus was hurting. Jesus felt abandoned. In his divinity, he knew that he wasn't. But being fully human, he felt abandoned. He asked his father the night before, let me get out of this thing. So when on the cross, he spoke from his heart. I found myself at first judging Jesus. Why would he say that? He knew what was going on. Where was his faith? What was going on? Was he starting to lose his faith? But how many times have I personally said those words? or felt that way? Why weren't you with me during that time of pain? Why did you abandon me when I had to make that tough decision? Why didn't you swoop down and help me when I needed you? We've heard during horrible times, and we have plenty of them in our world, where was God? Why didn't he stop that from happening? Why did he abandon those children in Florida? Why did he abandon those people at the concert in Las Vegas? Why did we abandon that poor person who felt prey to evil people? Why did he abandon that person who's fighting with cancer or suffering in such a hard way? For the same reason he didn't abandon his son. He was with him at all times, and he's with us at all times. His job isn't to take suffering away. If it was, why would he have let his innocent son suffer on the cross for us? The reason this was so difficult 
was that it made me look at those times when I lack faith. Those times that I think things should go my way and don't trust in God's way. It's Good Friday, and it comes every year. And it's good, and most of us who are ministers, and when Good Friday comes at some time or another, someone in our congregation will ask us, well, why is it good, Good Friday? It doesn't seem like a very good day, Good Friday. But the good in Good Friday, the good should be understood as Holy Friday. It's good in that sense. It's a sacred Friday. And throughout all of Christianity, it is held sacred, referred to by different names, Great Friday, Holy Friday, Black Friday. But it is on this day that we meet Jesus in perhaps a way that we do not meet Jesus any other day of the year. We meet Jesus today. Jesus is such a peculiar phenomena, this God and man together. And whenever you put this God and man together, I'm afraid that almost most days the God part tends to take over. He gets to be a little more and bigger and brighter, but not on Good Friday. No, on Good Friday, we see Jesus in his most abject his most wretched form, his most human form. And we see his face. And when we look into that face, as we stand before the cross, we see him like a mirror. We look into that face and it is like a mirror. And I say to you, it reflects the poor and the wretched of all the world the poor and the wretched of all the world look back at us when we look into the face of Jesus today and we look into his face and he says, I thirst. I thirst. 663 million people on our planet, you know, do not have safe drinking water. I thirst, he says. Every 21 seconds, a child dies of water-related disease. I thirst. Children without access to safe water are more likely to die in infancy or through their childhood because of waterborne illnesses. I thirst. Did you know that when you fill a five-gallon a can of water, it weighs 44 pounds, a five-gallon can of water. And the task of collecting water tends to fall on women and children between the ages of 8 and 13. And he looks at us and he says, I thirst. Lord, Lord, when... When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. I'd like to thank the A-team for putting the baby to sleep. (laughs) We continue our reading from John. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it. They put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. of all of Jesus' life and teachings, um, parables and and intimate moments with people, um, 
miraculous and ordinary, I find the hardest thing to wrap my brain, my, my heart, my soul around are these simple words, it is finished. I think this is the hardest thing for us to buy into and believe as followers of Christ, but just people in the world, that it is finished. That God's work of redemption and reconciliation really is done. It is complete. No more to do. Um, when we gather together on this day in this holiest of moments, we gather together also to stir our belief, our true and, and heartfelt embrace of these words. It is finished. That God's work is done, that this world has been restored, redeemed, reconciled through Christ to God, and there is nothing left to do. It is finished. I mean, may we live as people who believe that it is finished, that we are finished living in fear of terrorism and, and all of those things that cause us to stay glued to the TV. I mean, may we as Christians stand up and say, it is finished. We will not be haunted by violence or afraid to send our kids to school. I mean, may we stand up and say, it is finished. All of the, the moments and ways that we categorize each other and judge one another and put each other into little buckets of who's good and who's bad and who believes the right things and who doesn't, Jesus says, it is finished. God's love, unequivocal, poured out, done, complete. I mean, may we, though we struggle, embrace these words. May we see in the cross on this holiest of days that God has once and for all spoken to all of these things that, that cause us in our life to wonder, is there still more to do? And says that all are valued and valuable, that God's love is complete, is finished in this world. May we live out then with confidence and hope in all that is to come, that all that needs done to redeem us to God in this world is finished. May we live as people both of great sadness on this day and of people who breathe a sigh of relief that those things that we thought were so permanent and so scary and so endless have been finished by God this day. So he gathered up all the energy that he had left for this one last word. And with great effort, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. In moments like these, uh, people that I have been with and people that my colleagues here today have certainly been with in those last moments, so often people reach back to some important, strong memory. And in Jesus' case, he did the same. He reached back to words, no doubt, taught to him by his mother, from Psalm 31, which might have been used by her as a night prayer for her son Jesus. But in the cross, on the cross, Jesus used this prayer, this hymn, as his last word, his night of death prayer. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden from me, for you are my refuge, and into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O oh God, faithful God. In the final act of John Maysfield's play, The Trial of Jesus, the Roman centurion is discussing the crucifixion of Jesus with Procula, Pilate's wife. And she asks him, was he suffering much? No, lady, he wasn't a strong man. I thought the scourging would have done him in and killed him. And suddenly, remarkably, he began to sing, clear voice that he was giving back his spirit to God. And I looked to see God come and actually take him. He died singing. He died singing. 
he sang words right out of his traditional hymn book, the Psalms. And in that moment, he sang, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. These last words were not a cry of desperation, as if everything ahead was just empty darkness. His words were not the wretched wailing of one afraid, not quite sure what was to come. He had those moments. We heard of them earlier. But they were past now. Instead, these words are spoken by one who is calmly, peacefully surrendering himself into the arms of God. The life lived with God is a life of surrender, is it not? A life of commitment. There simply is no other way to relate to God. Trust and obey, the familiar hymn goes. Those who would be Christ-like are persons willing to trust and obey what they understand to be God's will. Admittedly, Surrendering to God is a tough thing for the followers of Jesus, is it not? Because surrendering also means committing, and committing is a difficult word, especially in our time. Many of us are afraid of it. We fear commitment to our jobs, to our relationships, to our churches, and even to God. The last word from the cross would tell us that surrendering is pretty important. With it, we embark on the road to salvation, and without it, that same road remains dark and ominous and lonely and forbidding. It is reported that when Gertrude Stein was dying in Paris, some of her friends stood by her bed. She opened her eyes and she asked, what is the answer? And her friends did not reply because they didn't know the answer any more than she did. Well then, she said, what is the question? And those were her last words. I must confess, that I do not know all the answers any more than you do. But I am sure I know the question. Am I ready? Are you ready to surrender? And Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit.
causes me to tremble. Someday for 